if Jesus was not sent to the Samaritans and the Gentiles, bearing in mind that Jesus' message was to prophesy about the Comforter, why was this so? Why wouldn't God want every tribe to know about the coming of the Comforter? Well, if you know the nature of Scripture, you'll, you'll know that God sent a prophet from among the Bani Israel. All the prophets came from a designated group of people, all the way from Moses, Abraham, all the way up. They came from a designated group of people in the beginning. But every prophet came only to a tribe, only to a specific people. This was God's way, his determination. God guided the world through a tribe, a group of people designated to be prophets. Until finally, God sent a person, a prophet, a messenger, from also a tribe, but not to that tribe, but to the whole world. This comforter, Jesus Christ, his specific purpose was to put in check and correct the excesses and the deviations of the banning Israel and then to announce the good news of a comforter. Now why God chose Jesus Christ to speak of that comforter? That's God's business. That is the fact. Such is the words of Jesus Christ that reflects that. And such is the words of Muhammad and the revelation that came to Muhammad Sallallahu that confirms that. What I would invite you to do is to look closely at the life of Jesus Christ, the real documented life of Jesus Christ, and the life of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, and see how they interlock. Read the message of Jesus Christ, the real gospel of Jesus Christ, to the best of your ability. As a matter of fact, I point you to the gospel of St. Barnabas. Now, you won't find that in the popular New Testament, because that's five books that's called the Apocrypha. Apocrypha means expunged, canceled. Because at the Council of Nicaea in 354 years after Jesus Christ, the Romans at the Council of Nicaea, they decided that there were five books that they didn't want to include in the New Testament. The Gospel of Barnabas, who was the blind companion of Jesus Christ, was not included in the New Testament. But if you go to the Gospel of Barnabas, again, go to your computer and punch in the word Barnabas. And then add to it Saint Barnabas. And you'll find that his genealogy and you'll find that his history and his biography was that he was the blind companion of Jesus Christ. And his book was called the Gospel of Barnabas. There in the Gospel of Barnabas, the name of Jesus Christ, I mean the name of Muhammad is mentioned clearly and perfectly. As a new revert from Roman Catholic, I'd like to know if we are children of God. Well, children in the sense that God doesn't really have children. He doesn't beget. That means God doesn't become pregnant, nor does God make anyone pregnant. By his command, women become pregnant. By his command, Mary became pregnant, but God doesn't beget because begetting and being begotten is a human animalistic function. But if we say that God is the father in the sense that God is the owner, that God is the Lord, that God is the sustainer, that God is the creator, and that we are the subordinates, and if we are good servants of God, God loves us, similar to a man or a person loving their children, then in a metaphorical sense, yes, we're all children of God, but not in the physical sense, not in the literal sense. And that's the only sense that Jesus Christ could have meant. As a matter of fact, Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, God said, Isaiah is my son. And he said, Abraham is even my son, and David is my son. So by that mean, God had sons by the tons. But in a metaphorical sense. He said, didn't Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the light? Nobody goes to the Father but through me? Sure, that means that nobody will go out of this room 
but through that door, but they're not part of the building. If I said, everyone will leave out of this, door, this, this, this building by that door, and there's no other way to go through but that door, that doesn't make you part of the building. In the time of Jesus Christ, he was the truth and he was the light. And he was the way towards God. Whoever followed him, whoever obeyed him, whoever imitated him, whoever loved him would find God, but that doesn't make him God by that statement. No more, no more so than a teller that works at the bank that hands you the money is the owner of that bank. And maybe Jesus meant the counselor was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was Gabriel, so that wasn't the counselor. The Holy Spirit, the sacred spirit, was the one that visited all the prophets, that also visited Mary, that visited Hannah, that visited Moses and Abraham, that brought all the scriptures. That's the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the Holy Spirit did come to Jesus, but that wasn't Jesus. And Jesus Christ did speak on behalf of God, but that wasn't God. So the people got confused, but the Romans, they already had, the Gentiles already had a triple God. So when they read and accepted what Paul wrote, they took the triple God idea, the pagan idolatry that they were already following, and they took the name of Jesus Christ and put it with them, and they called Angel Gabriel the Spirit, and Jesus the Son, and Almighty God the Father, and there you have the Trinity. But I ask anybody that's in here, does anybody in here understand how God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, a person, a person, a person. So God is a person, Jesus is a person, the Holy Spirit is a person, a person, a person, a person, three persons, one, two, three. How does one, two, three people get to be one? Give me that mathematics. Also tell me, how do they sit? How do they judge? Do God sit on the right? God sit on the top. Do God speak first or Jesus speak first? Did God speak and Jesus contradict? Who speaks first? Who stops? Who sits? Who stands? Who was there first? It's confusing. The Catholic Encyclopedia says concerning the Trinity, it is an absolute mystery that has never been answered until now, and it remains a mystery. Those of you who are Catholics have the Father, have the Cardinals, have the Monsignors, has the Pope, has anyone ever cleared up the mystery of the Trinity? Nobody, absolutely nobody. Because it remains a mystery. And another name for mystery is confusing. It's simply not true. No one spoke of a Trinity before 354 years after Jesus Christ. That was the first time the Trinity came about. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That whole notion, it happened 354 years after Jesus Christ. So don't blame that on Jesus. Blame that on those that conspired 354 years after him. Now it's not your fault that you were born into a Catholic family, and I'm not gonna say it's your family's fault. We're human beings, and we're creatures of habit, and sometimes we just don't know how to stop the habit. But I'll provide you with some indelible information that will rock your socks. <laughs> Literally. If you want it now. And understand this, I have no aspersions. I cast no aspersions. I don't disrespect the Catholic Church. I don't disrespect Christians at all. Everybody is given to follow what they want to. But if you want to uncover some rocks and see what's underneath it, I'll do it for you. After all, I don't have a problem because I've been there. I'll give you a little personal story. I'm not an orphan. But my mother had nine children. And unfortunately, she was born poor in Harlem. So when I was two and a half years old, I wound up in a foster home. And between two years old, two and a half years old, until 16 years old, I was in six different foster homes. 
and every one of them was a different denomination. Protestant, Baptist, Episcopalian, Methodist, Methodist, and Catholic, and Pentecostal. So you know I was all mixed up. <laughs> but by the grace of God, one thing that was clear, God was in my life. See? God was in my life. Different denominations, but God was in my life. So, by the grace of God, by the time I was 16 years old, I had kind of like tasted the whole buffet. So when I began investigating, I think I did a little bit of backtracking, a little bit of investigation. And that's why I can conclusively say to you that it's not necessarily the Christian's fault. It's your fault when you leave here. If you want to continue to plod ahead blindly and you want to ignore all the signposts, all the indications, all the propositions, all the indications that I've given to you, if you want to ignore that, you can. Or, if you're a Christian and you're sincere, I'll provide you with some more indications if you want to sit with me upstairs in that upper room.